Welcome back everyone. On today's episode, we're going to be looking at valuation, specifically valuation of the companies that I hold. In my portfolio, I hold 12 companies, all in different categories. In the financial category, we have companies like S&P Global, MasterCard, Intuit, and Moody's. In the tech category, we have Microsoft and Apple. I also own a couple restaurants, Texas Roadhouse and Chipotle. Costco is one of my largest positions. Vici is the only real estate investment trust I own. And then I also own a couple railroads, Canadian Pacific and Union Pacific. Overall, when I look at my portfolio, the goal is to have a collection of compounding machines, incredibly high quality companies. And I think so far I've met that goal. It's difficult to argue that these aren't great companies. I think most people have been persuaded or convinced that these are great companies. They're dominant in their respective categories. They face minimal competition. They have incredibly good management and they have a tendency to grow and grow and grow while having very high returns on capital. These are the type of businesses that Warren Buffett describes the best businesses in the world. But as we know, everything has a price and we wanna be careful to not overpay for these great businesses. Charlie Munger once said that no matter how wonderful a business is, it's not worth an infinite price. We have to have a price that makes sense and gives us a margin of safety. Buying a quality stock is one thing, but buying a quality stock for a low price is a quality situation. And what we're looking for here are quality situations where we can buy high quality stocks at discounted prices. We know that the world is unpredictable and ultimately valuation is subjective. We're all trying to make our best educated guesses at the future. Since we can't know with perfect certainty what's going to happen over the next five or 10 years, we try to use the best information today to make the decision that is most likely to occur. What we believe is ultimately the best risk and reward, the best opportunities today. In order to accomplish this goal of trying to model out the future, I've been working on a tool in Qualtrim. It's called Qualtrim Scenarios. And the goal of this is like the name implies, it's to allow you to build scenarios surrounding a stock to try to determine what is going to be the most likely or most probable outcome. For example, we can take MasterCard. You can plug in MasterCard and it gives you some basic information about the company. And then you can create a scenario. I can build a base case, a bull case, or any type of scenario that I want. I can plug in what I think is going to be the revenue growth over the next five years. I can say that I believe MasterCard is going to have some margin expansion. I believe that MasterCard is going to have better capital efficiency. They'll get closer and closer to Visa over the next five years. And then I believe MasterCard is a very predictable company. So I rate the predictability as high. This predictability rating helps work as the discount factor for the stock. So what I'm doing here is creating a discounted cash flow analysis for MasterCard. And it's based on these four simple inputs. The reason that I chose these different inputs is because revenue, margins, capital efficiency, and predictability are the four biggest drivers of intrinsic value. Everything that you can look at with a company will boil down to one of these metrics. Now, when I plug in the current market cap and hit create, you can see the five-year financial projections. Based on the assumptions you entered, this five-year projection shows you what the financials will look like for the company over the next five years. So you can get an idea of what to expect with the future of the company based on your assumptions. For example, in 2022, MasterCard did $22 billion of revenue. With these assumptions, we're assuming that that revenue will grow by around 11% per year, and the revenue will be around $37 billion in 2028. Based on our assumptions of growing margins and reduced CapEx spend, we believe that the cash flows in 2028 will be $19.58 billion. To put that in perspective, MasterCard earned $10 billion in 2022. So we're assuming over the next five years that MasterCard will nearly double their free cash flow. Now, if we look at this historically, that's exactly what MasterCard did over the previous five years. They doubled their free cash flow. So we're assuming similar growth rates in the future. So we have all our projected financial assumptions here, but we still don't have what we believe our returns will be over the next five years. That is where this next section comes into play. Qualtrum creates a return profile where it gives you a distribution of likely outcomes, different scenarios that can happen. And then based on the information that you put in, it gives you its most likely guess of what the returns will be. Those are highlighted in blue. Based on these assumptions, I believe that MasterCard's going to have around $20 billion of free cash flow in five years. If we assume MasterCard will trade at the same valuation in five years that it does today, that means the stock based on these assumptions would return 14.45% per year. So this annual return of 14% is based on MasterCard earning that $19 billion in free cash flow in 2028 and trading at a 2.5% 
free cash flow yield in 2028. If both of those things happened based on today's price, you'd have a 14.45% annual return. Now let's assume that those things don't happen and instead the free cash flow yield goes up. The company's valuation goes down. Let's for example say that MasterCard trades at a 3% free cash flow yield in 2028. Our annual returns would go down to 10.35%. If MasterCard traded up to a 3.5% free cash flow yield, the annual returns go down to 7%, and so on and so forth. As the free cash flow yield goes up, that means the valuation of the company is going down. It's getting cheaper and cheaper. And if a company gets cheaper after you buy it, your annual returns go down. If the company's valuation gets more expensive after you buy it, then your annual returns will go up. In this case, if MasterCard somehow got to a 1% free cash flow yield, which means it's very, very expensive, the annual returns would be 37%. So what this return profile shows is a distribution of possible outcomes. Lots of different scenarios for a stock. And it's up to our judgment to try to determine what is the most likely scenario. In the case of MasterCard, I think the company will continue to trade between a 2.5% to 3% free cash flow yield, which means my annualized returns will be around 10% to 14%. There is the possibility of the company getting cheaper and cheaper if it runs into trouble, the valuation goes down and the free cash flow yield goes up, or there's the possibility of the valuation going up if the company gets more expensive. But I think that the most likely scenario is right here, between a 2.5% to 3% free cash flow yield. So the returns that I expect from MasterCard buying it today is 10 to 14%. So that is an example of scenarios for MasterCard, what I believe is most likely to happen over the next five years, and the valuation based on those assumptions. And what I've done is I've created the most likely scenarios for every company that I own. I've gone through all of them, I've made the assumptions based on both the qualitative and the quantitative aspects of the company. And then based on that information, I've arrived at intrinsic values. I've created an intrinsic value range for every company on the spreadsheet. I have my undervalued range, my intrinsic value range, and my overvalued range for every company. And in this episode, we'll be going over all of this, my intrinsic value estimates for each company, and what I expect out of their future growth. So we have a lot to cover. This is going to be a pretty deep one. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and jump in and start off at the top. My largest position by total value is S&P Global. I bought this one heavily last year. We're only in the green by $15,000, but this one has only had one year to compound. So it really hasn't had much time to grow. Now I've gone over the qualities extensively of S&P Global. If you missed the episode I did on it, I did an entire 20 minute episode going over all the different business lines of this company, how they're monopolistic, how they're capital efficient, how they have everything that I want in a company. We know based on insights that S&P Global is a phenomenally profitable, exceptional company that has incredibly strong qualities. But this is all historical information about the company. To look at future information, let's check out some scenarios here. We'll bring up S&P Global. I'm assuming that S&P Global will grow around 7% per year. So we have 7% revenue growth per year. In the last two years, S&P Global has had unusually low margins because the company has suffered from the credit market going down. Lots of companies are holding back on issuing debt because of the rapid rise in interest rates. What I'm modeling out is that this will recover over time. So the EBITDA margin which is a percentage of EBITDA to revenue, will recover from 37% back to 48% over the next five years. I also believe this is a very reasonable assumption. I also believe that the company has incredible operating leverage. They're going to have less capex as a total percentage of revenue over the next five years, going from 0.8% to 0.5%. And at the end of all of this, we can see the cash flow the company should produce. Now these numbers, again, are not going to be perfectly accurate. They are guesses into the future based on these assumptions. So we can't say that it's going to perfectly produce $5.3 billion, but this does give us an assumption to work off of. Based on these assumptions, if S&P Global trades at a 2% free cash flow yield in 2028, we will have nearly 14% returns. If it trades at a 2.5, we'll have 8% returns. If it trades at a 3%, we'll have 5% annual returns. So the returns depend on what the company's valuation is at in 2028. I believe S&P Global will trade between 2-3% to 3 in 2028. So the returns will most likely be around 9%. When I wrap this into my valuation and I try to look at what the company's currently worth, I believe the intrinsic value is around $430 which is right around what it's trading today. It's currently at 436. So I believe S&P Global is fairly valued. When a company is as good as S&P Global and it's fairly valued, I feel no pressure to sell it. 
In these cases, I'll just hold on to the company. The next biggest position in my portfolio is MasterCard. We've already looked over MasterCard, so I won't go over everything again, but let's take a look at the simple assumptions here. If MasterCard trades at that 3% free cash flow yield in 2028, and it earns that $19 billion of free cash flow, then this stock based on today's price will have an annual return of roughly 10%. I don't necessarily think it's a strong buy or it's super undervalued at this point. That would be below $370. But at 430, I still think there's upside in the stock. Part of the reason I feel so strongly about MasterCard is because the company is such a predictable revenue grower. It grows along with the global economy. It has a royalty on the spending of global digital payment. So this is a wonderful company at what I believe is currently a reasonable price. Next up in my portfolio, we have Microsoft. This is a company that I have a total value of $63,000. It's $20,000 in the green. When I did my intrinsic value estimates last year, Microsoft was valued at $360. Now, I must mention that that was way above what the stock was at at the time. Microsoft entered 2023 trading at $240. So I said that Microsoft was worth over $100 more at the beginning of that year. Some people thought that was insane. How could Microsoft be worth that much? Well, here we are. Microsoft not only went to my intrinsic valuation, but it surpassed it at $388. This year, I've only increased my intrinsic value estimate of the company by $20, which is around a 6% increase. Microsoft has grown a little, but the price has also gone up dramatically. And over the past year, the price has increased far more than the intrinsic value meaning that I'm no longer making a prediction that Microsoft is dramatically undervalued like it was a year ago. Now I believe it's trading right around intrinsic value. My assumptions for Microsoft is that they continue to grow around 7 to 12% revenue growth and their cash flows in 2028 are around $108 billion. Now again, we can't say with exact precision what valuation Microsoft will trade at in five years, but we know it will probably trade in a valuation range of 2 to 3%. That gives us a range of returns that are healthy. All of them are positive. So based on the cash flows, I think this company will generate over the next five years. It's right around its intrinsic value range. Next up, we have a big one, Costco. This is a company that I've highlighted as one of the best companies in the world for a long period of time. A lot of people look at this company as boring, slow moving. They look at it the completely wrong way. Costco is a fast growing compounding machine, and it's been that way throughout its history. The free cash flows continue to march up to all time highs, 2023 being another record breaking year. But we know the phrase, even a company as good as Costco is not worth an infinite price. So let's go ahead and take a look at some scenarios here. My assumptions for Costco is that it's going to grow its revenue 10% per year, flat every single year. It'll probably be a little bit higher or a little bit lower, but I think overall that's pretty accurate. And that's how Costco has grown over the past 20 years. So we have a lot of data to inform the future of this company, and they're still expanding all across the globe. So I assume strong same store sales growth and strong new location growth with Costco. I also believe that the price increase in the membership will be another growth tool for this company. So 10% annual revenue growth for the next five years. Another thing that's slowly happening with Costco is the margins are going up over time. They're getting these economies of scale, and they're also opening up less future warehouses compared to their total existing warehouses. And warehouses are their primary capex spend. So both their margins are going up and the percentage they spend on capex to their revenue is going down over time. This means that based on my assumptions, I believe Costco is going to produce around $9 billion of free cash flow in 2028. Now you might believe that's a lot of free cash flow, but consider how much they did just in 2023. They did almost $7 billion. Next year, they should have around or above $7 billion in free cash flow. So they're already pretty close to that. I'm looking for an incremental increase of $3 billion in free cash flow over the next five years. We get to the return profile and here lies the problem. Costco trades at such a high valuation that it doesn't leave a tremendous amount of room for upside. For example, if Costco traded at a 2% free cash flow yield in 2028, we'd only have returns of 8.5% per year for the next five years. That's good, but that's assuming that it trades at a 2% free cash flow yield. If the free cash flow yield goes down to 2.5% or 3%, 
the returns go down notably. Costco is an incredible company. The qualities are unmatched. It's really one of a kind. The issue with the company is simply the price, the valuation. The company raced up so much over the past five years, up 220%. Just in the past one year, it's up 40%. This company's like a rocket, far above the S&P 500, but that does create a valuation issue. Looking at the stock now, there's far more scenarios of getting negative returns if the company runs into valuation issues. If there's some blip in the story, some bad quarter, and Costco trades to a lower free cash flow yield, the returns on this stock will go down notably. So when I take all of this into account, the financial projections and the qualities of the company, I believe that in 2023, last year, Costco was worth $450. This year, I've upped my intrinsic value estimate by over $100 to $560. So I believe that Costco has done incredibly well over the past year. They've had record-breaking results. They have new members signing up. They have new warehouses in China that are showing explosive demand. This company is on a great path, but it's simply overvalued. Currently, Costco trades at $680 per share. I believe the intrinsic value is $560. So I believe the company is over $100 over its intrinsic value. In the overvalued range, I think that's above 620. So to me, Costco is currently well above the overvalued range. Now this raises the question, why don't I sell my Costco shares since it's now overvalued? I think it might be easy to say to sell your shares and buy something that's at a better valuation, but the truth is that right now, most things are either fairly valued or venturing into overvalued. So there's not a lot of opportunity cost by holding Costco. Next up, we have Intuit. This is a company that was new to my portfolio in 2023. I bought in heavy to this company because I believe that it presented very good value. And I became convinced that this company was going to be one of the big winners in the tech category over the next five years. Intuit's doing a lot of things with artificial intelligence. They have many highly entrenched dominant monopolistic businesses. Intuit currently trades at $600 per share. I bought the company at $445. That's my average price for it. I think Intuit will have around 13% revenue growth for the next five years. I'm keeping the margins mostly the same, but I believe most of the growth is going to come from revenue, not from margin expansion. In terms of capital efficiency, this is already a very efficient business. After all of this, we get $6.3 billion of free cash flow in 2028. Now, based on this information, I believe that in 2028, Intuit will have a free cash flow yield of around 2 to 3%. I'll say 2.5%. That's what it currently has. That's around an 8% annual return. So Intuit to me is no longer undervalued. The biggest problem here is that over the past year, it's up 55%. This company's gone on a great run. That was great when I originally bought in, but I'm not buying it today. I believe Intuit trades around its intrinsic value, which I put around $600. The overvalued range would be 750, the undervalued range would be $500. I'm currently holding the stock at 445. I'm not selling, but I'm also not buying. Next up, we have a real estate company, which is Vici. This one I have $56,000 of value in, 10,000 of that being gains. This is one that has mostly traded around the same price, but paid hefty dividends along the way. In 2023, I put the intrinsic value of Vici around $36. For 2024, I'm maintaining that same intrinsic value estimate. Now you might be asking, why didn't I move the intrinsic value estimate up for Vici over the past year? The fact is that Vici has a lot of long-term contracts, 40-year contracts with their tenants. So they are uniquely sensitive to interest rate fluctuations. Interest rates have gone up a lot over the past year. So even though Vici has grown, I believe that the intrinsic value relative to interest rates has remained the same. If interest rates go down, I believe that Vici will trade up closer to this estimate. We don't know what direction interest rates are going, but if I had to guess, I think there's more opportunity for them to go down than to go up. After Vici, we have Apple, which I have a total value of $52,600 and currently $23,700 in the green. My intrinsic value for Apple in 2023 was $190. And in 2024, I put the intrinsic value at $190. Like Vici, it has not changed year over year. And if we look at Apple, we can see that the main intrinsic value drivers of the company have stagnated over the past year. For example, the revenue is flat over the past year. The free cash flow of the company is also flattish for the past year. The earnings per share of the company are also flat for the past year. And the capital efficiency has also remained the same year over year. I treat all of my holdings fairly. If they have no intrinsic value growth, 
then the intrinsic value estimate stays the same. Now looking at Apple over the next five years, I do believe they'll continue to grow at a slow and moderate pace. They'll have 5% growth in 2024 and 2025, and then 6% growth moving on from 2026 forward. The reason that I believe the growth will continue is because Apple has now more installed devices than they've ever had before. Over 2 billion active installed devices. That massive install base will allow them to monetize in lots of different ways. So we should still continue to see moderate top line growth. I also assume margins will increase over time as a bigger percentage of their business moves to services. Services are higher margin portion of the business. So as Apple grows that service revenue, the margins will go from 32% overall to 35%. I assume the capital efficiency of the company will remain roughly the same. Based on these assumptions, if Apple trades at a 3% free cash flow yield in 2028, That'll be an annualized return of 9.1%. So I don't believe Apple's massively overvalued like some investors do, but I also don't think you're gonna get fantastic returns buying in at this price point. I believe the company will give moderate returns. For that reason, I'm not buying the stock and I believe it's close to its intrinsic value. Moving on, we get to the restaurant, Texas Roadhouse. This has been a really fun holding to have. Currently at a total value of $51,000 with 15,600 in the green. This has been a big winner for me over the past two years. Texas Roadhouse is one of these companies that I feel like was a bit of a Peter Lynch buy. The reason that I started investigating this company is because I noticed continually how busy the restaurant was all the time, every evening, not just at one location, but at every location around me. Everyone that I would visit, this place was always packed, especially on the weekends. I thought that they figured something out. And investing in this company and seeing the execution, seeing the growth that they're able to have every single year has been awesome to see. We see around 13% revenue growth per year. I think that's what Texas Roadhouse will average. The margin should expand over time as they push the higher margin items like the drinks and they get to further scale. There's not gonna be a lot of margin expansion because they are a restaurant with a lot of input costs, but they will have slight margin expansion. And I assume roughly flat capex over the next five years. So we have no capital efficiency improvement. We get around $500 million in free cash flow in 2028. Now for reference, last year, Texas Roadhouse made around 265 million in free cash flow. So I'm assuming it will roughly double over the next five years. Based on these assumptions, if Texas Roadhouse traded at a 3% free cash flow yield in 2028, that is an annualized return of almost 15%. That is a really good return, especially in this market where everything feels a bit expensive. If the valuation goes down and the free cash flow yield goes up, the return goes down to 8%. But even in this case where the free cash flow yield goes up and the valuation goes down, the return is still healthy. In the case that the valuation increases, the free cash flow yield goes down, that's where the returns get really, really high. But overall, I believe a 3% free cash flow yield is most likely. I believe that Texas Roadhouse over time may pass up some of my holdings like Apple in size because it's growing so quickly. Now, after Texas Roadhouse, we have Canadian Pacific, which is currently my only company in my portfolio that's in the red. It's in the red by $300, and the total position size is $31,700. So we're basically flat on this company, but overall, I'm disappointed in the results because it just hasn't performed well over the past couple of years. I believe Canadian Pacific is a highly predictable company that's an oligopoly. It's in a very concentrated industry and it's an incredible asset with an incredible CEO. It should see steady revenue growth over the next five years. This is something that the management believes they can accomplish. I'm estimating around 8% revenue growth per year. That takes into account a little bit of inflation and then some natural revenue growth as they win more contracts, they take customers from trucking companies. More companies are looking to save money on shipping. Now we also have the margins of the company, which I believe will remain flat over the next five years. So I'm assuming zero margin expansion in terms of their EBITDA margin. The CapEx, however, I believe will go down as a percentage of total revenue. Management has already said that they believe that will happen. They said the CapEx spend is going to be flat as the revenue grows. Now again, none of these assumptions will be pinpoint accurate, but we're trying to work with probabilities. What is the most likely outcome? With these assumptions, I believe the company will trade 
around a three to three and a half percent free cash flow yield, which if that happens, we should see a very strong return with Canadian Pacific, anywhere from 16 to 20 percent. A 16 to 20 percent return is one of the best estimates I get out of any company in my portfolio. And this is why I believe Canadian Pacific is undervalued based on today's price. It's a company that I've recently bought into. I have not seen success so far with this holding, but I'm going to hold steady with it because I believe if the management can pull this off, this could be a big winner. Next up, we have Chipotle. This is a company that I have $28,000 invested into, $4,000 in the green. I consider this one a half position because I bought in around halfway of what I wanted to, but it raced up so fast that I wasn't able to make a full position. Chipotle is one of these companies that I've had on the watch list for a very long time. I followed the company for years. I knew I wanted to invest in the company. I just had to be patient and wait for opportune timing. And it happened in 2023. We saw the company have a bad quarter and it sold off big time. It went from $2,100 per share to around $1,800. Then it traded down to around $1,700 per share. This is when I bought the company, right here during this dip. Now I did think the dip would last a bit longer. I thought it might trail down a little bit more. So I was buying into the position, but hoping that I'd get an even better price in the future. Chipotle quickly reaccelerated their same store sales growth, which was a curveball for Wall Street. Since it was such a better estimate than what Wall Street expected, the stock took off, racing to all time highs. So here I am with my half position in Chipotle. I'd like to own more of the company, but I'm gonna be patient and wait for a dip if we get one in the future. You might notice a common theme. I believe a lot of my companies are near their intrinsic value. And that's not what I was saying last year. Last year, I thought a lot of them were well under their intrinsic value. But so many companies have moved up in price. They've gone up to higher valuations that I'm finding a lot of my companies seem more reasonably valued than they did last year. With Chipotle, it's no different. I believe the company currently trades right around its intrinsic value. I think the undervalued range where I'd look to buy it again is below $1,900 per share. And then where it gets so overvalued that I'll probably look at selling it is around $2,700 per share. Right now, I think it's in a nice range of its intrinsic value. My assumptions of Chipotle are that it continues to grow relatively quick at around 13.5% per year. So top line revenue growth should be strong because they open up hundreds of new locations per year. They also have an incredible amount of brand recognition, pricing power. They have a lot of digital app features. And Chipotle is one of these companies where it's giving you the best of both worlds. You get rapid revenue growth while you get margin expansion. The margins will also be expanding over time. Based on these assumptions, in 2028, Chipotle will be generating around $2.3 billion in free cash flow. Now the company currently trades at a higher valuation, around a 2% free cash flow yield. If they maintain this same valuation and it trades at a 2% free cash flow yield in 2028, the annualized return would be 14% per year. Now, if the valuation goes down, that annual return goes down. If it traded at a 2.5% free cash flow yield, it goes down to 9%. If it trades at a 3% free cash flow yield, it goes down to 5% per year. Even if the free cash flow yield goes up and the valuation goes down, Chipotle still gives positive returns over the next five years. But I believe it's most likely for Chipotle to trade between a 2 and 2.5% 2 free cash flow yield in 2028. So the returns that I expect are between 14% and 9%. Because this stock relies on maintaining a higher valuation, I believe it's fair valued right now, and it's not one that I'd be looking to buy today. When I was buying the stock, it was closer to the undervalued range at $1,900 per share. Next up, I have Union Pacific. The current value is $21,000, currently $3,000 in the green. Now, the story of Union Pacific is quite different than the story of Canadian Pacific. Canadian Pacific is a fast-growing, well-ran, highly optimized railway system. Union Pacific is a no-growth, unoptimized railway system. Union Pacific's operating metrics are so much worse than Canadian Pacific's, it shows up all over the financials. Let's go ahead and take a look at this and contrast some of the financials. First of all, we'll look at Canadian Pacific. We can look at the EBITDA margin. It's currently at 64%. 64% EBITDA margins for this company. If we switch over to Union Pacific, it's 50%. So the margins for Union Pacific are dramatically worse than the margins for Canadian Pacific. And that all comes back to leadership. Overall, the goal of Union Pacific is simply to become more like Canadian Pacific, to have a railway system that operates with higher efficiency. And they brought in a new CEO, Jim Vena, 
to accomplish that goal. Union Pacific is not growing its revenue over time. It's been flat for the past 10 years. So the story of this company is not with top line growth, and that's different than every other company I own. The story with Union Pacific is increasing their margins closer and closer to companies like Canadian Pacific. If they increase their margins, not all the way to Canadian Pacific, but just closer to it, then we still get attractive returns out of this company, even assuming almost no revenue growth, just 2% growth, which is in line with inflation. So we have margins expanding from 50% EBITDA margins to 62%. Current day, Canadian Pacific's is 64%. I believe that the CEO of Union Pacific can increase the margins over time. He's done it before, and he's done it in a faster timeline than five years. If Union Pacific is able to increase their margins this much over the next five years and get a little bit closer to Canadian Pacific, the company will produce over $10 billion in 2028. Based on that $10 billion of free cash flow in 2028, if we assume it also trades at a 4% free cash flow yield, which seems entirely reasonable, we will have an annualized return of 11% per year. That's a healthy return assuming a reasonable valuation in five years. But typically, if a company increases its operating margins, investors find that more attractive. So the valuation should move up the scale. The free cash flow yield should go down closer to Canadian Pacific's. If that happens, we could see returns of 15% per year, which is a very high return in today's market. There's of course risk to this story. If the new CEO, Jim Vena, cannot increase the operating metrics of the company, if the EBITDA margin does not climb over the next five years, this company will underperform. It will not beat the market. But even in such case, I don't think there's significant downside. This company is very reliable, very steady. It does dip from time to time, but has always recovered throughout history. So this is a company that I believe is a very attractive asset with a meaningful amount of upside and limited downside. Now, finally, we move on to my last holding and my smallest holding by far, which is Moody's. I currently have a position of $5,000 in it, which is less than 1% of my portfolio, currently $96 in the green. I just bought in an entry position into this company just to get my foot in the door, but I fully intend on growing this position once I get dips in the future, which I'm sure will eventually come. Moody's is an exceptional company with two different businesses under it. The first one is Moody's Investor Services, which is the credit rating business, this highly reoccurring, dependable business of rating different debt instruments throughout the world is a globally dominant duopoly shared with S&P Global. It also has incredibly high margins and it's incredibly difficult to disrupt. The other half of it is Moody's Analytics, a highly profitable subscription business with over a 90% retention rate. So each half of this business is incredibly good. The entire business overall is superb. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the assumptions I made over the next five years. I'm assuming around 9% revenue growth which is an average and this will be up and down year by year because the credit market responds to interest rates some periods there's a lot of debt issuance some periods there's not as much but I believe the average will be in the high single digits when I look at the EBITDA margins I believe they're going to improve over time Moody's has shown over decades of time that the company has operating leverage they have scalability. As they grow in their revenue, their margins go up as a result. So I have the EBITDA margins going from 43% to 48%. They're also showing that their capital efficiency improves over time. I believe in 2028, Moody's will generate around $3 billion of free cash flow. In 2025, they're expected to generate around $2 billion. So this estimate should be somewhat accurate. If Moody's trades at a 2.5% free cash flow yield in 2028, that is a 12% annualized return. If it goes up to a 2% free cash flow yield, that's a 16% return. If the valuation goes down to a 3% free cash flow yield, that is a 7% annual return. So I understand it's difficult to buy a company that was trading at a cheaper price just a month ago. I suffer with that anchoring bias as well. I wish I could go back one month ago and buy some of these companies. But the truth is, based on my estimates and my assumptions, I believe this company still offers decent value, and it's an incredibly high quality company at the same time. So I'm happy to have Moody's in the portfolio and build this position. So there you have it, the valuation of every stock in my portfolio. One observation I have is that I believe my stocks are for the most part fairly valued. They're closer to their intrinsic value this year. Last year I thought they were deeply undervalued. So last year I was introducing new holdings. I was buying heavily. I introduced a lot of companies like Chipotle, S&P Global, Intuit, MasterCard. 
This year, I haven't done the same because I believe the price has increased for companies overall and the valuations are not as attractive this year as they were beginning last year. It's harder to find deals in today's market, so I'm going to be waiting patiently with a lot of cash for the next dip to occur. But that's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.